So we'll turn the time over to him. Uh, I'm sure that you'll find it interesting. Let's give him a warm welcome. Right. Thank you, Mark. Hi, uh, as you've heard, my name is Anthony DiGiulio, and I started a company called DiGiulio Seed uh, a few years ago. It's a just for a doing small investments. I do seed investments, and I do advising, and I go around and do various lectures, um, speaking engagements for different topics from everything from like this, think like an investor, what does it take to be involved in a startup and how do you attract investors and it goes everything from dealing with the product the team and the execution plan and so we're going to discuss uh, <coughs> all of that in here Jeff can you hit that one light behind you because this is going to be hard to see back there is that better yeah so I'll give you a quick overview who I, who am I and the existentialism point of view here so I am, as Mark was telling you, very involved in high tech from the very beginning of my career. For the past 20 years, I've been working in networking, telecommunications, software and hardware solutions. I used to sell everything from hardware in terms of Cisco switches, routers, DSL systems. When DSL first came out, I worked at a startup. We had DSL modems um, and we were selling those all over the world. And going into the software side, I worked on different software uh, companies where we would do software with hardware or just software by itself. This is very important to understand, especially if you're a startup. If you're doing SaaS or if you're doing software and hardware together um, that we call an ecosystem. So we were selling, I was selling big systems, these OSS, BSS systems to telecom carriers, which sell for you know, tens of millions of dollars. And the licensing on those things is just, it's, it's just ridiculous when you talk about if you're a startup and you're really concerned about licensing legalities and how to do all of that, uh, there, it's a, such a varietal way to do things uh, that it takes a very specialized law firm just to do licensing for software. Um, then I've had a, uh, my current, should we say, uh, startups that I'm working with there are a couple one is a hardware software platform and one is a, a software platform only as a software as a service and I'll get into detail a little bit about that um, the foundation this is a actually a book that I'm working on right now and it talks about the foundation of what startups need to have in order to succeed or how to be a startup and it goes through some of the things I was just mentioning, the product, the team, the execution. And then we're going to quickly go through those because each one is a two-hour lecture by itself. And why do I speak on these uh, from the point of view that I have is strictly through experience. Um, all the years that I've been working in, the telecom, the networking, the software, the high tech in, you know, in general. The only job that I haven't had that wasn't uh, real high tech was I worked at another startup that did heart ablation catheters, these devices that went up into the heart to fix heart arrhythmias. And that was another very interesting uh, startup experience for me in the healthcare industry. Um, the reason why I focus on this and what we're going to focus a little bit today, startup founders tend to really look at the quick answer, the quick solution. Right? I mean, when I speak, the f all the questions that always come up, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? And it's, they, don't, they haven't been listening to what I've been talking about. Or there's so much information out there on the web, they really haven't been doing their homework. And everybody's just looking for, how do I get in front of investors? How do I convince them? You know, things like that. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, and then the end point here, the dollar, the money that we're all going after, and the risk, risk, and risk. That's a key factor, and I'll explain what, what that means as we go along. So first of all, when you start a startup, you have to have a product, something to offer to sell, right? And the product is the main factor. A lot of companies say that it's just team, team, team. When you talk to VCs, what do they always say? Number one issue is team. I don't fully agree with that and we'll explain why and show you examples of how teams have been successful 
who shouldn't have been successful and it's because of their mentality or they've been successful because of the product the product sells itself sometimes and it's hard to believe that but we'll go into the the variables there the product and the team are tied together at the hip and there's not really a system that says it's just the team that we invest in uh, but it's the the joint venture there of the product and the team because if you are at the level of VC funding and they say, hey, you've got an incredible product, but your team isn't that good. Are they going to say no to you? No way. They're going to say, hey, let us help you build your team. Let us put the team together so that we can bring that symmetry between the two. So be very careful when you talk to investors, whether they be seed investors like me or the VC levels. And if they keep focusing on saying there's only one thing that matters, walk away. Don't waste your time and your money. I'm going to explain that a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> so the main issue here, does the product have value? And the value is based on, is it satisfying a need, right? Is there something that you're putting out there physically as a hardware, like a Fitbit device? Is it satisfying people's needs? What are those needs wrapped around that device? You know, Fitbit is actually now, many people don't know this, but they're going into the healthcare industry with their Fitbits because they're going to be selling this to healthcare providers who want people to wear these Fitbits now. Nobody ever thought of this before, but the uh, man and woman, I forget, they just I met them a couple months ago, they put this plan together to say, hey, health providers are worried about certain types of people who have heart conditions and so forth. With a Fitbit, they can walk around and collect the data, right? It's very, very interesting how that type of product has evolved and it satisfies multiple needs for the active person and for the person who may not be very healthy and have a heart condition or have other conditions that this Fitbit can collect from your body's uh, heart rhythms and other instruments that they're actually going to put on you. So the product is, that's a key value. Why does your product have value? And a lot of you will just say, oh, well, it does this. It cures cancer. Well, you know, maybe not everybody has cancer, right? Let's think about that. You, you need to think in terms of, is it really a, a product that has value that people are willing to buy, to use, and to share? With, you know, because word of mouth, right? It's a very, very interesting key point. So is the product useful and attractive to investors and customers? And that's what I just described a little bit. Investors, um, again, they, they may come to you and they, they look at this product and it may be a really great product, but they don't understand it right now, right? And maybe you're a couple years ahead of time. You know, I was in a company like that. We had a product that nobody really understood and we couldn't get it to work properly on the network because our current networks weren't able to support it. We went out of business. <laughs> and uh, the investors, we actually spoke to some investors, and they said, we just, we, we don't see it working. And they really knew. This, I learned this. This was uh, one of the investors. Um, he was a longtime Sun employee. And the other guy that we talked to, <coughs> excuse me, had been working at DEC, D-E-C. Many, many of you don't know that company, but <laughs> that was a uh, very, very historical company. And they, they both told me, he said, you guys, this is something that isn't satisfying a need right now. And sure enough, it was four or five years later that it started happening. So we, uh, we kind of missed out on that. <laughs> now, the very key point here um, is what does the product consist of? Is it software, hardware, right? Is it online services, licensing, support, strategies? All these types of products. Why, why is it important for you to be in that industry? What are you trying to do with that product? How does the investor look at these? Um, you know, is it just software? Is it just hardware? Or is it an ecosystem? We call that going out, buying an HP server, putting some software on it, and then selling that to an end user. The, the whole idea behind that is you, you really need to understand what your product is really made of. A lot of these SaaS companies, they think their product is just their software as a service product, and this is why they fail. 
I'm working right now um, with Dropbox on a particular hardware product right now. They miss the point, a lot of these SaaS companies thinking they can just go on to AWS and start up and doing everything like that, but the software isn't worth a damn unless you have a solid hardware platform that's running on it, or the ability to deliver it, or what is your support strategy behind it, right? Again, you could have a fantastic SaaS offering, but if you don't have support, who wants to work with you? And I've been through this myself. I've been on GoDaddy for setting up my website. They have very good support. They're very good at everything there. And then I also am working with um, using One and One as another registry company for registering your software, I mean, registering your website in domain names and things like that. And they have email services and everything like that. Their service used to be kind of so-so. And, you know, I left them, went back to them. But it all now revolves around their support strategies. Incredible. Mm -hmm. They are phenomenal. You call them up, you can get everything taken care of within five minutes. Very, very good. And I had the same experience. Anybody have a Dell laptop? That's why I, I used to have a MacBook Pro. I had the worst experience with Apple in my life I've ever had in my life. Never went back. Dell, just the opposite. And that's what Dell is rated as, the number one uh, support, customer service. That's why people keep buying Dells. And it's, you know, they may have problems, little problems here and there, but this, I call it the support. And the guy just says, oh, just pull off the back, replace your RAM in there, it's loose. That was one of the issues, right? I mean, one of the RAM modules came out. Simple things like that. But I, I've never seen a better support coming from any other company that I've had to work with. And I've had to put Dell systems into carriers, and Dell is always there on time. They, get, they take care of them very well. So the product is not only the physical product or your software or your service, it has to do with your support also. If you go to an investor and say, hey, we've got this huge rollout of this and everything else, and they say, great, how are you going to do your licensing and how are you going to do your support? Uh, we'll, we're kind of working on that. Okay, That's a key issue, a very key issue for product nowadays, especially when we are so consumer oriented. Everything is connected. And it's all about uh, customer support. Now, the product, when you're going out, the investors want to know, who do you have right now as current customers? Who cares if you have a product and nobody's buying it, right? Today's environment, investing environment, is so competitive. And there are so many products, so many startups out there, that if you have customers already, you're, you're way ahead of the game. That's the big key. That is one of the main keys that all investors look for. Again, they always say team, 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 and so forth. Well, if you already have sales, then you've already proven that your product is worthwhile and that your team is actually able to do sales. Maybe your team needs to be, you know, put some more people in there to make it even better. But if you don't have sales, um, you won't get money. It's, it's a dead market out there right now. There are some instances for startups that need money, need an uh, uh, influx of cash flow in order to get their product out there. That's a very hard sell, right? I mean, if you are trying to find the cure for diabetes and you guys have, hey, we have this whole thing, we ran all the computer simulations, and if we match these cell prototypes with another cell prototype, it'll work but you need about a million dollars to do that. For certain types of investments like that, you're going to get funding. And I know a lot of people, I just met some healthcare people just this morning at a Starbucks and we were talking about that a little bit. And a lot of people forget that there's also government funding. Write this down. <laughs> because you'd be surprised at how many startups out there can get government funding. When you are doing biotech, things like that, there's a lot of government funding out there. There's also a lot of universities who will also give you funding. So think, remember about that. It's not just biotech or anything like that, but there are other options uh, for that. And that's uh, when you're talking about sales. What is the investor's point of view for the overall product? This is very important because um, it, does it fit with their knowledge base and their experience? 
I won't even talk to a company. I had a company come up to me last month. They said, hey, we, we talked to somebody at another company who says you're, you do fantastic work. You're able to get us business development, sales, or anything like that. Help us with product management. And I said, that's great. I said, I can pass you off to somebody else. And they said, no, we want to work with you. I said, I can't. I said, you know, I'd be shooting you and myself in the foot if I was going to help you because I don't know that industry. I don't know that customer base. I don't know what your competition is. I don't know how to judge that. So if your product is in a certain industry, and you better know very well what that is so that when you go and do speak to investors, mm -hmm you have a little better understanding of what is available out there and what is not. Um, because if you get an investor who really doesn't understand you and your product, that's a bad mix. That's a very, very bad. And I, I know of two companies, and I'll explain them to you at, towards the end here, that that has happened. And it's simply because the investors got involved too much and they didn't know what the product was. Um, the other thing is, is their view right about your product? As I just told you, when we started, we tried to do a, uh, a network product that was too early to the market, and the investors said no. They were right. <laughs> they really knew because there just wasn't a cus ability to have customer adoption. Also, they, a, a, an investor might tell you, your product needs to change. It needs to be able to do X, Y, and Z. You need to do something else with it. Are they right? How do you know that? How do you know if they're right? Look at what those investors invest in. If you go to an investor, either an early stage investor or a VC firm, look on their website. See which companies they have already invested in. If you're going into the healthcare industry and you have a healthcare product, you're going to go after these specific VCs. It's amazing. I just spoke with uh, Mike over at the Lights, Lightspeed Ventures. Anybody ever hear of Lightspeed Ventures? They're a very popular uh, venture firm. He goes, in the last six months, he goes, I have gotten products that come from the strangest markets out there that we don't even are not even involved with. They specifically state right there on their, where their, who their customers are and who they invest in. But startups don't pay attention to these things. They just flood the market. And that's, they end up shooting themselves in the foot with that. So that's very important. So the, that's why you want to understand the investor's point of view on your product. Are they going to tell you the right thing about your product? And it all comes down to what their, what their experience is, what their history is. It's very important. Now we're into the team. And does the team really matter? You'd be surprised at, um, how should I say, that certain companies, startups, who have stacked themselves with, I mean, big time players. These are multi-millionaires. They're all getting together and they're trying to bring this startup out. They syndicate, what we call syndication, when we do startups. Or, and now all they're trying to do is create a stir and get things going. Um, but if the team is not able to see the same and share the same vision, like right, right now there's a new company called Apstra, A-A-P-S-T-R-A, -A -A, one of the best startups I've seen in probably 10 years. They do a special SDN software for network management. And they have three people on their, in their company who started this company. They're, they're amazing people. Um, They've nailed it. They laid it down. It's just three of them. That's it. And then they have a guy in there, uh, Jeremy, who's their customer success person who does their sales. They only have a few people. But it's all about that team. They have, they're so well known. One of them is a Stanford professor who's very famous in the computer industry. And then um, the CEO has been doing business development and sales in this type of area for 20 years. And he just picks up the phone and says, hey, we got, a new, we got a new product. And the person says, yeah, send it over. We'll test it. Uh, and their CTO, he's, he's Sasha. He's, he's really an amazing person. So this is where the product or the team, what comes first? 
do you get together? Do you say, oh, okay, let's, let's get some people together and develop a product. Let's develop something because I have this great idea. Or do you sit down and work on the product yourself and then build your team around it? It depends. It really, really depends. Uh, if you have a couple of friends together and they say, hey, we can invent a whole new eyeglass thing like Google Glass or something like that. Well, if you can do that, and you can get that product done in such a way that you create a demand for it or a use case and so on and so <laughs> forth, then that's your team right there, just the two of you, let's say. Then you have to build the team out around that. Remember Facebook? Zuckerberg didn't know anything about business. He didn't know anything, literally, about how to build systems and do a complete uh, network topology on how to bring those systems out and get everybody up and running on Facebook. So what, what happened? He spoke to a couple of people. His parents were very well connected. They talked to a couple of people and boom, everybody started coming together and they got the big hitters, right? That was the team, but they had the product and the product is continually evolving, right? So when you go and you talk to investors, um, your team is again it's product and team going together whoops it's never just one or the other so when the investors judge a team they always look at your past achievements how do you do that when you're 25 years old right you can't you can't so that's where what comes into play more than anything is the product because the investors will then say, okay, well, show me your business plan. How do you guys plan on executing this? How do you plan on doing everything? Because you don't have any history. You don't have any experience. And then the investors will say, this is great. Uh, yeah, I know some business development. I know some software engineers. I know hardware engineers, whatever it takes. We can put them in there. And you as a startup at 25 years old should say, absolutely, let's do it. Be open-minded. And we'll get to that in a minute. So what are your current achievements? Let's say again, you're 25 years old, doing a startup. Well, your current achievements are, first of all, you've built a, a product, a platform, whatever it is. And you can show them that you have laid out a plan. You've done it X, Y, and Z. You've been working on it for two or three years, and it's up and running. That's a big achievement. Investors just say, wow. You know, you, you did this all on your own, you spent your own time, your own money, and you did it. And you, you, you've got passion. That's, that's the key right there. What are your current achievements? Um, and then knowledge. What is your knowledge base as a startup? If you have, like I said, two people in a startup, you're pretty limited especially when you're young, 25 to 30 years old, your knowledge base isn't going to be that great. Unless, of course, you guys are software engineers, let's say, who are, you know, have, you'd be surprised at how many software engineers are phenomenal, you know, in that age range, of course, right? That's, that's the way of the world right now. And so they, they look at that. What is, your, what is your knowledge base? How can you affect the product going forward? How can you affect us as investors? based on your knowledge base. It's, these are the things that you need to look at when, you, when you're talking about team and you're presenting your team. If you don't have a team, you go into investors and you say, hey, it's just the two of us. Don't be scared. Take the chance. But do your research first, and we'll get to that in a minute. Figure out who you are and what you are. That is so important. Many startups don't understand that, and it's hard to explain um, to people who are in that age range, who are in their 20s, don't understand that necessarily. They understand the technology, they understand how to design, engineer, and so forth, but they don't understand who they are and what they are. So one of those engineers could be the CEO, and he doesn't understand it yet. One of those engineers, inventors, she could be the VP of business development and sales, but she doesn't know it yet. This is key. This is where you have to kind of sit back and say, hey, I, I'm a startup and I don't have the answers yet. But that's what the investors are there for, hopefully. Yes. I was just going to add, isn't it good to also get some advisors? 
Well, that's, that's the whole key. That's what I was saying. So when it's a team, it's just the two of you and the investors say, we're going to put these people in there. That's what they do, right? If they get a board seat, I mean, we're talking VC level or whatever and so forth. And it's all about that, getting the advisors and people surrounding them, like I was telling, like Mark Zuckerberg. And he just surrounded himself. I mean, he just sat there like, what was that in Star Wars when what's his name was in the middle of the circle and they had that big circle meeting and all the the wisest people were around. That's what Zuckerberg did. And he, you know, and another person I know is doing the exact same thing with another startup, which isn't public yet. <laughs> and um, she is surrounding herself with all these people. Oh, and another one. Oh, a friend of mine, Amanda, she started a company called Six Sense. It's a big data analytics and a um, company that does predictive analytics for sales. That's what she did. She wrote an algorithm. She has incredible sales and business development background. But then she surrounded herself with the top engineers up in San Francisco and just started executing one step at a time. She went to two investors. That's all. They both jumped on it. And they're, doing ex they're w worth over $100 million already. Execute. This is the biggest 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 point <laughs> everybody says it's all team and product but if you can't execute you're not worth anything your product isn't worth anything your team can hasn't shown that it's worth a darn you gotta get that product out to market you have to do these tasks in order to produce a better product in order to produce a service whatever it is right it's all about execution and if you don't have a plan laid out, a step-by-step -step plan for execution, no investor will give you money. And I, my theory is that if you don't have the plan laid out, at least a three-month plan. I mean, you don't have to, you're not looking years down the road. That's a waste of time, to be honest with you. But within three months, what are your tasks? What are your goals? What are you going to achieve? Can you achieve that? And if you go to an investor and say, look, this is, what, this is our plan, this is what we've done, this is what we've been able to do, and it shows that you've completed 90% of your tasks or even 100%, very, very attractive. I'll throw money at you all day long for something like that because it shows you know how to do a project. You know how to get to an a endpoint, and that's what investors are all about because investors and you – you're looking for an exit strategy. If you can't execute, you have no strategy. You have no exit strategy. A lot of people say they want to sell their companies and so forth. A friend of mine who's um, Amanda, who is doing her company, she's not really hell-bent on selling. She's just like, you know, we're executing, we're doing everything well, we're all making you know ridiculous amounts of money. If that exit plan comes along, it'll happen. That's the attitude to have because you'll execute a lot better. You'll have a better focus because you're, if you're continually thinking down the road, you're continually missing your point right at your feet. And a lot, a lot, a lot of companies have done that. So the key point for execution is how does an investor know that you're capable of doing this? Well, just as I described, you have a plan laid out. You showed them what they can do, plus the investor's experience. A lot of investors uh, actually don't have business experience. You'd be surprised. They all have MBAs, a lot of them, or they're attorneys. Uh, but they haven't been hands-on doing business development and sales. They haven't been engineers, right? They haven't been in the trenches. But when they look at your project plan and see that you're executing, they can at least judge that, right? So do they have a similar experience? If you can find investors that have been in the trenches that are doing something similar to what you are doing or have done some kind of a startup, um, those are the people that you want to talk to because they will understand your point of view and they'll understand your execution plan better, a lot better. Um, I was at a meeting last month with a venture firm called Artemon, and 
the one person that I know very well there, we were sitting down and talking about a current investment, and he didn't know it. He didn't know the, the business. He didn't understand the product or anything like that. But the people, the three people that were involved for this startup had laid out a plan for, th for the past two years. And they showed what they executed on. And they actually wrote out in detail what they failed on and why they made mistakes or whatever. They just went back and fixed them. They went back. They have a knowledge base. They were able to identify these things. But then he, the investor at Artemon, passed it on to another person because the other, the other um, partner there had a similar experience with another company for exactly what the investor, what the startup was doing. So he passed it on to them and is now, you know, advising them and everything like that. They're not investing in them, but he's still advising them to a point where they may invest later on. So this is another option. We'll, we'll, we can have discussions about that. And again, we're back to the history with similar companies. Your investor, if they have similar companies on their list, then your execution plan will resonate better with them. Plus, you will also be happier working with them. You'll have a better point of view to share going forward. Okay. This is, um, I, I keep saying this over and over, like all the, the investors always keep saying it's team, 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 and everything like that. I say it's investors more so than it is your team because the investors can always bring in the team if they're smart investors. It's a very, to differentiate between these um, is very hard to do, and it's, it just takes years of experience. It's sad to say, but uh, there's also a lot of information to be able to to look that up online. This is smart investors. When you go out and you find somebody who's just willing to throw money at you, hey, take it, you know, why not? Run with it. But you really want to be successful and you want to do well. I created this term, uh, TOF or GOF. I call this uh, investing based on, <coughs> excuse me, task-oriented financing or goal-oriented financing. So I spoke at a, uh, a lecture a couple months ago at a VC firm, and I said all VCs should be doing this. They should be saying, okay, we're committing $2 million to you, but we're going to pay you $200,000 per month as you accomplish tasks, as you, you set your goals and you accomplish these goals. If you say, hey, we're going to sell 1,000 of these, when you get done selling 1,000, we're going to give you another 200000 what that does is it creates, puts a little, you know, hot coal under everybody's butt, so to speak, right? And, but it produces results. And it also protects the investor's money. It also protects you from being irresponsible with their money. Uh, there's a lawsuit going on right now for another company. All the investors who put money into this company are, are going after the company. And of course, the common law says you, can't, you can only sue the company if it has money. Well, they filed for bankruptcy. They now have a special case where they're speaking to the judge. They're going after the individual now. And we're going to see more and more of this. Uh, this is an issue with the, uh, the SEC and with the high courts right now in the U.S. They're going to allow investors to go after uh, the individuals now. Uh, and it's, it's a big fight, a big battle. So pay attention to that. Uh, and when you sign contracts for investing, make sure that you cover your ass in the way that you, that you state that you're going to do specific uh, statements every month to your investors to keep them up to date. Uh, because if you do that and you still fail, they can't sue you. But if you hide anything, anything like that, there's these new laws, I'm pretty sure, are going to go to an effect within the next one or two years. Doesn't matter. This is that's the issue that they're trying to uh, figure out right now, like I said, with the high courts. This company, they're going after these two individuals because they misled investors on purpose. Uh, even though they're in a company, they can, you know, they have an LLC, like you say. They can do that and walk away. But... 
uh, the courts right now are trying to figure out the best way to deal with that. And it's a big battle right now because I'm going I'm to show you a company that did that. Any of you know the TV show Silicon Valley? Anybody? Yeah, that's, that, I love it. <laughs> okay. You want to learn about startups and you want to learn about investing and you want to learn about how to get royally screwed <laughs> by yourself or by everybody around you? That's the best show. You will learn so much just by watching that show. Go on Netflix or Amazon. There's three seasons of it right now and just watch it. It's hilarious. I mean, these guys, they nailed every character that's available in Silicon Valley to the T. And you, you will, it's just so funny. And you will actually learn a lot. It's, it's amazing. So the next situation we have going on um, beyond execution. Remember now we're talking about product, we're talking about the team and the execution. Those are the three main points for your startup. I think Jeff Faust, everybody look back there. Raise your hand. He's going to be speaking tomorrow at InnoWest on valuation. So we're going to talk about valuation now. Um, yeah, see? The applause, yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow, talk to Jeff. He's going to be speaking. It's a very important lecture to learn about valuation in a company. Valuation is one of the worst things you have to go through. No, I'm not joking. <laughs> because... It's all, uh, it's all a bunch of witchcraft, you know, it's, it's voodoo, like how do, how do you properly do a valuation on a startup? <laughs> so, valuation, why do we need to do valuation? Well, in order to gauge in the value of investment, right, how much money am I going to give you and why? What is my percent when I give it to you and I invest in your company? What is the investor's point of view? So does an investor come in and say, I want to value your company at $50 million. I'll give you, <coughs> excuse me, I'll give you $5 million for a 10% stake. There's a lot of, if, you know, if, ands, or buts when you're dealing with this. What does that involve? What is the, what is the valuation involve? Why is valuation a key factor for startups and why like when a company goes IPO why is the valuation so important that's a whole nother lecture for two hours I can do but what we're looking at here is the best way to judge your value as an as your startup as individuals and it's also the best way for the investor to gauge their investment on a high-risk stake so the, when you look at the investor's point of view, they're going to try and be as fair as possible, absolutely. Because if you overvalue a company, it's really, really bad, really bad. And I'm going to get to that at the end of this. But if you undervalue it, it's also bad. Um, undervaluing it, in my opinion, is the best way to go, and I'll tell you why. But it, a lot of uh, investors don't want it undervalued because they want to see themselves and they want to see their firms as investing in a valuable company sometimes. So there's a, you got to be careful with the marketing and with the point of view um, on that. They want to see that there is a value being driven. So if they invest some money and your company is worth $10 million, they're going to say, we have a very good investment and we want to drive that $10 million to $20 million or to $15 million within a certain amount of time. The valuation on the exit price. So, we, as I just mentioned, when you, when you go into an exit price and you want to sell, of course you want the highest valuation possible. Okay? But when you do a valuation on an exit price, it's not you. And it's not necessarily your VC firm that's going to give the valuation. It's the buyers. It's always the buyers. The investor, when they come into your company, they're the buyers. They're going to give you the valuation that they see. Exit price is going to be done uh, through a lot of very, very smart people, hopefully. A lot of attorneys, uh, a lot of business people, a lot of industry um, know-it-alls, so to speak, when, they, when you do an exit price. So we're just going to touch on that real. I'm just explaining how these things 
uh, are done. But I'm going to just rush rush through this a little bit because Jeff's going to speak about all of this tomorrow at InnoWest. How is evaluation done? So it's done based on market, the current market prices, market value of the same or similar product or service. All right. So if you go out there and you say, hey, I'm going to sell this car. I'm, I'm making a new car. We're starting up. We're going to sell this thing for $10,000. It's a real low end, cheap car. Well, what's the market value of your product, of your company, if you're going to sell 100,000 of those cars? So what do they do? They go and they look at Ford, Kia, all the cars, companies, and see what the current value is at selling those cars, right? That's a very simple, fast, effective way to do it. What is your product? That's another value that's brought in. I work for a startup right now. Um, we don't have high value because our product isn't very disruptive. It's a standard product that has been around for 20 years. There are 10 major players worldwide, but we still have a few million in sales. Why is that? Well, that's because we, we just know this product and what it's able to do. But the valuation on the company, we, we, I, when I started working with these guys, I said, we'll never get investment. And the CEO is all, no, we have to get money. We have to get money. I said, we'll never get money. I wouldn't invest in you guys. You know, I, if I was an outside investor, there's too many, there are far too many players. It's a, it's a saturated market and it's not very disruptive. But what your software can do in the GUI platform, right, in the display form and things like that, that's disruptive. But the overall technology, it's 20, 30 years old. But you guys can make money. We can all make money. And that's what we're doing. So you need to understand um, based upon things like that. If your product is so disruptive uh, and you ha literally have investors calling you, like in the TV show Silicon Valley. <laughs> When these guys had the, uh, everybody knew their product, everybody loved it, and they had, they had people sending them gifts or whatever, trying to get their engineers to leave the company. They had big company, Hooli, you know, trying to buy them for ridiculous amounts of money. But it's very disruptive. Is your product standardized? Is it a disruptive product? Is it something that a lot of people are doing? Um, it's, you know, there's value based, there's still value based upon what's involved. And you need to understand that. And the person who's doing your valuation needs to understand that too. Um, maybe or maybe not. It's, uh, it may not even be worth an investment. Like I just said, the company I'm with, we, we, can't, we can't buy investors, literally. Current sales, that's a huge, huge, huge. That's the number one issue right there. If you have a lot of current sales, uh, your valuation just just skyrockets and you can go and say hey we have five million in sales our company is worth ten million dollars investor will come back and say no you're actually only worth seven million and here's the reasons why and then you're gonna go oh that might be true you can go out and get valuations from different people like Jeff mm -hmm. it's not that expensive it's not that cheap either it's a couple thousand dollars um, or a few thousand dollars actually to get that done, but it may benefit you in the long run. What is your team? Again, that's part of the valuation, right? Everything we talked about previously is all fits into the valuation. The pitfalls of valuation, down rounds. Again, you go out and you say, hey, my company is worth five million dollars, and the investor says, no, you're only worth two million. And uh, they say we're not going to take your you you know we're not going to invest in you because of that, but if you go out and you get somebody who actually says you're worth five million dollars and they give you money based upon that valuation, and a year later, you don't have five million in sales and you need more money, <laughs> the down round you're going to have one of the hardest times in your life. You thought the first pitch going in and trying to raise money was hard, down rounds can even be harder. Because the people who come in and they invest, there's a higher risk now. The down round means that your company was valued at a certain amount. It's now valued less than what that is, what that currently was, or it's 
supposed to be valued, let's say it was $5 million, it's supposed to be valued at $10 million now, but it's only valued at $7 million. That's, how, that's another way that they judge down rounds. You're going to have a hard time getting investment. Somebody might say, okay, we're going to invest a million dollars, but we want 25% of your company, and we want two board seats or something like that. You don't have a choice. You're going to have to say yes because you're going to go out of business if you don't take the money. But their risk is so high. You have to understand that's what it's all about, the risk, the risk, the risk. So avoid that. Take a lower valuation in your company always. Because if you skyrocket, your valuation goes up, you're going to be worth a heck of a lot more. Right, Jeff? It's <laughs> I'm, always in, I'm always into that. Even if somebody does a valuation, this happened to a friend of mine, uh, their company. They got valued at $13.5 million. And they said, no, we think our, we want our company, we want our investment based on a $10 million valuation. They were smart. Their company's worth about 60 something million dollars now over the past three years. Three years, four years? Four years now. That's incredible growth. The value on their company, I mean, they, they have $60 million. The actual value, if they were going to sell right now, is over $350 million. Yeah, they're very smart. They knew what they were doing. And that's because one of the board members, when they first got together, he was a, he's an attorney. This guy's amazing. He's got an attorney law degree. He has a master's and MBA degree, and he has an engineering degree. He knew exactly what he was doing because he's been involved in two other companies where his first one, he was, you know, they were all cocky and they wanted the highest valuation. And they really screwed up because they didn't do very well. And the down round for them the next time was ridiculous. They had to give away 50% of their company. You don't ever want that. Don't ever lose control of your company. Okay, the money process. We're gonna, we got just a few minutes left here. We're gonna run through, there's two sections to this. So, pitching and raising money. Everything I just described, you've got to understand. You've got to have that ingrained in you, and in your business plan, everything. The product, the team, and the execution capability. Do your research. When you go out and you want to start pitching to VCs or whatever, there's so much information on the web, there's no excuse for you to be, quote, ignorant of the process. There's no excuse at all, not, not, not in today's world. Ten years ago, this was, you, could, you couldn't find stuff on the internet that described everything very well. Now, there's so much information on how to do your research how to do your um, pitch and everything else. Look again, as I described before, if you go onto a VC firm, you go online, and they all, a lot of them have these submit. Submit your PowerPoint to us. Describe what you do. About 98% of them don't get responded to. I'm not joking. Because they don't follow the simple instructions on the website. It's real easy. Or they do follow the instructions but they don't understand how to put together their PowerPoint. They don't understand how to present themselves. Big problem. And you could have a great, great product and not get the funding simply because you don't understand the flow and how to do things. What round of money are you looking for? This is key. Don't go knocking on sending your, your PowerPoint presentations out to the VC firms. If you're a seed round or you're an early stage, if you're looking at maybe 200000 to 500000 don't go on the VC firms. We're talking, they're over a million dollars. They want big money, you know. Series A is also a VC firm, usually, but it's also coming down now to what I call the household investors. People who are, because there are so many ridiculous amounts of millionaires now. The Series A funding is, is coming down to people that are on, like AngelList. You can do, um, special sites, Seed Invest. Take a look at that. That's another site that you can go out there and do your, your Series A round on. But you, again, again, and again, you need to understand what are, the, the, what are the types of investing. Syndication, write that down. Look that word up, do your research, find out what syndication is. Try to avoid it as much as you can. It's a very dangerous form uh, of, in, of doing investments. Unless, of course, you know the people that are involved in the syndicate. A lot, this is where a lot of people get together and they do 
a syndication where they bring your company in and they try to get investors through a syndicate, through a group to invest in you. Um, there's a lot of messy work involved with that. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. But um, I haven't seen very many successes coming out of that. And it's like a, uh, it's like a, um, a network of buddies, of friends doing these syndications. Uh, I'm not a big fan of them, but some of them have been. Jason Calacanis, he's a big fan of it. Uh, I spoke to him about that one time, and I just, it's not my style, that's all. So do your research and see if that does fit in. No, it's, uh, a syndicate is more like, you go on angel.com, Angel CEO, you put your company out there, you list it, and you contact these people. So if you go to like Jason Calacanis, he's involved in a syndicate where he has a group and there are, let's say, I don't know, 500 people involved in it. So now he alerts these 500 people and say, hey buddies, we got this company over here. Here's the, here's the investment prospect. And what they do is they set a standard of, you have to put $5,000 in to be involved, a minimum of 5,000, or they set, you know, they set the minimum on that. And it becomes kind of like a crowdfunding, but it's more in, it's in a syndicate form that's run by these very advanced, um, well-known um, investors. And again, it's, it's a way for all of them to spread their risk. But the problem is, is that it's, it's in a group and things like that. You don't have advisors necessarily. You don't have the ability to pick up the phone and say, hey, we need some more help or you know, things like that. It's a way, it's also a way for, it's early stage seed is a lot of what it is. There's also syndications at higher level. Seed Invest uh, works on that a little bit. Seed Invest is another good site, a good resource to learn from about all these things. Um, as I'm listed out there on both of those. But again, it's, the key is understand the round. Just because you're a startup, you're not a Series A. That's the first round that VC firms tend to look at. Um, you want to look at seed, angel. Angel is mid-range. You know, the seed and the angel are kind of coming together. Anything from $50,000 up to $100,000 is one range. $200,000 up to $500,000 is the next area. But even seed and angel, I've seen them up at $3.5 million, $4 million. Yeah, they, they list themselves as seed and angel investors at that amount. Um, and are, are, the, are the legal terms any different? Not really. <laughs> no, it's just, you know, we, we try to categorize everything. And a lot of the Series A, what you're doing there is you're selling stock, right? Uh, a convertible capability into stock. You have that availability in any one of these. However you want to have your legal, the legalese stated in there. You can set up your terms any way you want. And as long as, you know, the investor and you are agreeable, you can do anything you want that's within the law. So don't feel like you're getting locked in to anything like that, to specific deal um, legalese or anything like that. Anything, I mean, we're talking, it's a contract. Anything is legal, as long as it's within the law. Match your needs with the investment type. Seed, angel, how much money do you need? Uh, when do you need it? Um, those types of things. How long is it going to take you to shop around and do all that? Match your needs with the investment type. If you only need 500000 then go after 500000 Ask for $1 million. Always ask for more because you can always say no. You can say, no, we just want 500000 Some investors don't like that because for a certain amount, they get certain rights in your company okay? or they get a certain percentage. So you have to understand the value of the investment. What are you giving up to gain this? And you have to give up, and it's not a bad thing. So don't, don't think it's always, a lot of people are very negative about the VCs, that they always say, oh, VCs are just trying to take control. They're trying to screw us. No, the VCs have to make money. Because the VCs don't own their money, a lot of them, most of them. Above them is the bank, where they have multi multi billionaires and millionaires dumping money into this system and then they pull the money down out of that so they have to be accountable also not all VC firms uh, are that way some VC firms are the investors themselves are you know multi billionaires or millionaires 
but most of them are. There's a capital crunch <laughs> above them. This is the pool of money that's being dumped into their fund. So they have to be accountable. And if they get a bad reputation for screwing people over, they're over. You get blacklisted for your startup. You get blacklisted as an investor in the Silicon Valley. Forget about it. You're done. So everybody's trying to make money. Everybody's trying to be amenable, shall we say, with each other. And you have to be. That's just life. Now, how do you know which type you are? Again, we're talking about are you a seed, an angel, a series A? Okay, this all depends on a couple of things. How far along are you with your product? Is your pro does your product have customers? If you have, you know, let's say one to two million in sales, you can do a series A just like that. As long as everything else has been shown. You have team, you have execution, you have everything else. You can attract money just like that. You don't have to have a seed or an angel. Right? You can jump into the Series A, which gives you, if you, after doing a Series A, it also gives you exposure to more capital, more funding later on. That's the difference between the seed and the angel. Seed and angels tend to be smaller groups of people, right? And then, but a, and a Series A, uh, you are in, that means you're, in, you're kind of in what I call the mainframe of investing. And that's usually done through a, through an a, uh, through a VC firm. Or, or a law firm, even law firms invest money. So those are things you need to understand of which type you are, how to do all of that, okay? The second process, let's get through this. Um, this is pitching and raising money. Comprehensive PowerPoint and PDF, whatever. You're gonna send it out, you're gonna present it, whatever you're gonna do. Has got to be easy to follow. Has this slide deck here been easy to follow? I mean. Is it understandable you know, as I'm explaining it? Okay, okay. You guys gonna invest in me? <laughs> so that's what I wanna make sure. It just needs to be easy to follow, simple and easy. VCs are not the sharpest tools in the shed. Uh, absolutely, and they will tell you that. And a really good friend of mine who's at Artemon, he goes, you know, he's an engineer by trade. Hasn't been doing engineering for 15 years. 20 years, he goes, he goes, everybody's way beyond me. Everybody is, you know, engineering or anything like that. He goes, all I know is money. And he goes, and I know this just within my certain box, my certain frame. So always, always, always apply your PDF, your PowerPoint, everything you're doing, teaching to being that simple and easy. Always think that you, you're talking to a crowd that doesn't know a darn thing. Make it as easy to follow as possible. Few questions need to be asked per slide. That means put your slide deck together and each deck, each slide is simple and easy enough to follow uh, that very few questions need to be asked. Okay, leave the detailed technical info for very last. So if you're gonna go in and you're describing your software product that is gonna do X, Y, and Z and go across the board, you don't wanna, as soon as I start reading technical documents like that, I go, oh my gosh, this, let's get to the first point. What does the problem, what does your product solve? What does it do? How does it do it? Then at the end, because this mindset is already, you've already put the seed in there for the investors. Now when they look at the technical background, the technical drawings or details or whatever, they can apply what they've just learned into that. Always put technical details last, always. Okay, another thing, if you're going for money, you've got to be open-minded. You've got to have a positive attitude. You've got to be flexible. You can't go in and say, hey, we're only taking money for X, Y, and Z, and we're going to do it just by these terms. <laughs> I have yet to see that happen. It never works. Unless, of course, I'm telling you, you have the cure for cancer. Yeah, just raise your hand, and everybody will come to you, and you can set your own terms. But if you're not open-minded, you're not positive, you're not flexible, nobody wants to work with you. It means you're close-minded. It means you're going to be a pain in the butt to deal with. You know, if we want to bring more people into the company, you got to have a willingness to change and to look at alternatives. Every single successful company has been that way. Look at Apple. As much as I, I'm not a fan of Apple, but they've changed and they've always looked at alternatives. That's their big 
thing. They've been very open-minded. Even though they have a closed OS, right, everything else, but what they've done is they've looked at, there were some products that they were coming out with, and they got it out to market, and they said, no, we're not going to waste any more money on that. Let's switch over to this, or let's do that. When they first did their iPod, it was a completely different idea that they had, but nobody was interested. So they stuck to the tried and true standard. Um, and that was the whole thing. This, my friend Amanda, I'll mention her again, she had a, a product, the whole Sixth Sense product. When they first started off, they were looking down this one path, this one road. And then when they talked to a couple of engineers into this one investor, he says, hey, you guys could also go this way. And they went, oh, we never thought about that. So now they, they have a couple of different streams of revenue for different markets. You've got to be willing to do, be able to do that. Okay. Okay. This is, we're running over here. Um, I'm going to run this. I'm going to wrap this up. These are some examples that I've worked with. So I'm going to go real quick here. Cannabis. Cannabis is the, one of the biggest investments right now. Healthcare, cannabis, and software industry companies. This cannabis example, I met this woman, and she was trying to do edible cannabis uh, with small micro doses of the uh, THC and the, the marijuana inside of there. Because a lot of times when people have to do medical marijuana, they, they smoke, but they can't tell how much they're getting, and they get too much, and people don't like that. And, way that some people react. So she had this beautiful plan, everything laid out, and so on and so forth. And she already has a chocolatier firm that does incredible chocolates. But she thought she had the cure for cancer here, literally. She said, I'm only doing investments. I want my company to be based on a $10 million valuation. I said, have you had a valuation done? She says, no. I said, then I don't want to talk to you anymore. I'm done. I pushed her aside. She kept coming back to me, kept coming back to me. And she had this attitude that she was just not going to change and not do anything. She's been bl literally blacklisted. Uh, everybody knows her. She has turned down real, she has to get a whole manufacturing site. She refused all these great deals. A buddy of mine who runs a commercial real estate company, huge one, says, I won't even, he, he goes, oh yeah, we, I called him up, to check on her. He goes, oh yeah, we've talked to her. Nobody in my entire firm, and they also work with three other commercial, she was blacklisted. You've got to be open-minded. You've got to be willing. And she has, in a, the current company that she has right now, she has a gold mine, and she's not willing to work with it. She didn't put any skin in the game for this. My DPI company, we're making money, but not a market investors are interested in. I described all that, and we're making changes in the overall product to even make it more attractive as we go down. We're looking down the road, and we probably won't ever need investment. Um, but these are examples of us shifting, being flexible, and so on and so forth. Terranos. Anybody here know of Terranos? Terranos was this big company that came out of this girl who quit Stanford, 19, 20 years old. She started a company of blood testing where you draw the blood, and she said, we can do these tests in half the, one, in 50% to one-third the cost of all other um, test of sending them out to the labs when you get your blood lab done. So she f they had a product and the team you would not believe. It was all, her parents are very well connected in Washington. George Schultz was on the, on the board. They, she had the guy from the National Institute of Health on the, on her, in her company. She had uh, all these people, big Washington elites and so on and so forth. They had the team, right? They could sell this company day and night. The product was a lie. And every time I went to one of the investment meetings and she was pitching, I sat there and one guy asked her, this doctor goes, I want to see how you guys are doing this. What examples do you have? She goes, we don't share that information. And I went, oh, red flag right there. We don't share how we do that. I said, so then I raised my hand. I said, what about the patents? She goes, we have all the patents we need. I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, I can't explain. So I said, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> what happened? Well, they got caught. And now the company is being sued, and they're trying to figure out how to actually do this blood testing. The main doctor involved, had, you know, he had lied and said that it could be done. But they actually didn't do what needed to be done with their product research. It could still be done. They're still doing it. They're still, they're still alive, but 
nine million dollars later they they went bankrupt and this is one of the companies that is up on the explore what they call the exploration table for going after the uh, going after the owners okay she really screwed up employee engagement company this is uh, I can't tell you this is the other uh, startup that I'm working with we are very open-minded we're very flexible I mean the 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 software engineer who invented this product, he's just a great guy. We, we have a great time together. We are right now working with uh, a major university for our product. And we have Google after us. And we have <coughs> uh, Netflix and another uh, major company who want us to do this software for them. We just don't have the manpower right now. We don't have the time because of certain things. but. This is all because we're open-minded, we're flexible, and we have three investors just already throwing money, wanting to throw money at us, but we're, we're staying back from that right now, and there's certain reasons why. But to understand that we, this is an employee engagement platform, it's kind of like a LinkedIn for companies, internal companies, to work on projects and all kinds of various things. I can't tell you too much about it, but we have one of our main customers that we're working with right now we're actually giving it to them for free because they helped us totally develop this and we're going down five different paths because of this we said no we're only going to go down these two paths and then we started looking at this looking at this and then we started going down these five different paths of what the product can do and that's when everybody that's when you know like Google and everybody said that's what we want we need that boom come on board so be willing to be flexible but make sure you have the team to do it because we don't right now and the last one here, Uber. <laughs> Uber is a fantastic company. I was invited to the ver one of their first pitches. Um, and uh, he came up, and it was, uh, it was only 25 people in this meeting over on Sand Hill. He comes up, Travis was his name, one of the, the co-founder, and he looked like he'd been run over by a bus. And, I just, and I'm sitting next to this guy from uh, Sequoia, and I go, geez, man, what happened to him? And he goes, I think he got run over by an Uber driver. You know, it was just, I, mean, I started laughing, but he had been on the road doing a road show. He had been out trying to pitch this company. He'd been setting it up in New York and Chicago, getting drivers and everything all set up. I mean, he just looked like hell. He had his tie on that wasn't tied up tight. He had his shirt untucked a little bit on the side, and he was just standing up there, and his hair was tossed. And I went, oh, man, I feel sorry for him. But he was still going. He knew what he had. And he had, he had passion. It was unbelievable. He kept going and going and going. And then he talked about it to all these. These are all big. This is my first foray into really getting into the big investment time with these guys. So I just sat in the back of the room and I watched. And he did his presentation. At the end of this presentation, everybody's hand, my hand, everybody's hand went up. And all anybody was concerned about was the legal concern. How do you protect against everybody getting crazy drivers, you know, all the insurance and everything like that? And he says, well, we're doing it. We have this. And he told us the law firm and his slide. He showed up a couple of other slides. He had everything laid out. And he says, for the stuff we don't know, he goes, that's why we're talking to investors. He goes, we're looking for advice. We're looking for this. We're looking for that. He was very open-minded. He was just willing to learn. You know, and I didn't, you know, I didn't understand Uber and all that stuff at that time, and nor did the guy sitting next to me from Sequoia. He goes, he goes, this looks like a really hard company to sell. You know, and I said, yeah, I know, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand it, what they were trying to do. Look at them now. But he kept going, and he knew what he had, and the investors, what it was all about was the way that he was presenting. He kept going. He had everything laid out, um, and the, the main questions that people had were all about the stuff that they hadn't figured out yet. That's all. But he had everything else laid out there. And he was very open-minded. So, okay. That's good. That's everything there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for going over. Okay.